is again, we're looking through the, the book of Isaiah, uh, and Isaiah is describing the coming of a future ideal ruler who will renew David's royal line, and the stump of Jesse. He will be gifted by the Spirit of God, and the ruler will reign with perfect justice. Enmity and danger will be no more, and harmony and peacefulness will coexist on the earth. And so listen now to Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. Uh, the peaceful kingdom. A shoot cut shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his great roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he, his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Richness, rich righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The return of the remnant of Israel and Judah. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples, the nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be his. <coughs> this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, God's future is greater than we can ever or even possibly imagine that it is going to be. But sometimes the circumstances of our present world make that future hard to envision. God surely created the world to be much more and much better than the world that we see in the news and around us each and every day. The world that we see around us is a world of war, a world of political motivation and manipulation, a world of, of economic exploitation, of senseless violence, a world of greed and ambition. And it's surely going to be better than the world that we have in our own lives at, some time, at certain times. A life where relationships can go foul, where there's death of a partner, where we have failed eyesight or diabetic nerve pain or arthritic fingers or chronic diseases that, that force us to, to be less than who we were created to be or even forced retirement. There are so many things that, that weigh upon our lives and yet it's, it, it, it's a cruel moment when our innocence is lost and we see our world for what it really is. When we see that our world is filled with injustice and poverty and oppression a world where people are starving and homeless, exploited and abused. A world where there's depression and misery. It's a harsh place, this world that we live in. But God promises us a new kingdom. In, in election years, candidates uh, often set themselves up as the triumphant <coughs> leader who bring back the good old times. And so when, where everyone is prosperous, where there's no war, no, and communities are living, Free from the threat of violence, and children are happy, and we're all just in this wonderful place. At least that's what the commercials would lead us to believe anyway. And we see this idyllic picture of lush lawns and happy families and beautiful sunsets and nostalgia is invoked everywhere on the screen. And it's an intentional nostalgia that's meant to invoke this harmonious time that we imagine ourselves to have lived in. Which is, of course, never the full truth of how things really are. Isaiah prophesied to a people who knew what it was to be a part of a world where there was war and threat and danger. And so the Assyrian people, they had run strong and violently all around them, take, taking over nations everywhere. And the stories of war and exile of the northern kingdom at the hands of the Assyrians in Isaiah's day, they surely were, were known by the people of Judah. And the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they faced the very real possibility that the Assyrians might conquer and destroy them as well. There, there was no innocence or naivety about the world that they were living in. And so the passage that we see 
in our Advent journey for today and allow us to see a moment into that kingdom. And we see those glimpses of how life could be when we read Isaiah's coming message of a coming king. We also are there and he offers us peace that passes anything that we can ever imagine. To these people, Isaiah is speaking these words of great hope. He also speaks words of great hope to us even today. Isaiah's remarkable litany of promises. It begins humbly. Looking at the ground, he says, look at the ground. He seems to say, where else are you going to find this stump? There's a stump there, a stump that we presume to be dead. Uh, it's impossible, but it's impossibly bursting with new life. And so look down at the ground, but know that the ground beneath your feet is not the ground that we stand on now, but the ground of God's holy mountain, a realm of peace and justice that is dependent on the advent of this new leader that is coming. Isaiah's portrayal uh, of the, this particular leader, he's a, a person born of David's lineage. And he's a leader who explains the, the reason that we should have hope. He has the very spirit of God resting upon his shoulders. He is God's son. He's infused with God's own understanding and God's counsel and God's might. And he doesn't lead with the faulting and faltering and the fallibility of an ordinary man. He embodies and brings divine justice. Under his watch, the poor and the meek will be lifted up and there will be no room for evil and oppression. On this mountain, even the predators will be peaceable. The language is of equity, but, for, but with righteousness the, they shall judge. He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Equity, equity requires distribution uh, of the elements. It, it requires distribution uh, of those things that have been lacking. And it's based on past and present inequality. Equity sees that there has been an equal distribution and up to this point, and it redistributes things and rectifies that. Isaiah, he's pointing an idyllic picture for us. But it's no mere fantasy. It, there is a leader coming, he tells us. There is one who will lead with authentic faith and righteousness. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and under his rule, everything, everything will change. There, this is not about pie in the sky or a vision of some otherworldly realm, but a
All who know about the journey from hopelessness into hope recognize Emmanuel, the presence of God with us when he walks among us. All of us know the surprise of God's presence as it comes into the midst of our chaos and our despair. Sometimes, irreconcilable irre relationships are reconciled. Sometimes, unforgivable sins can be transformed by grace that God shows. Sometimes, survivors can thrive to become anew in a new life beyond the pain of their past. In these times, God's kingdom it breaks into this present day and it reveals blessed glimpses of God and the glory that is yet to come. And now, our task is to trust that the Holy Spirit, those sacred shoots, will arise and that God is here working those wonderful miracles among us. And to praise God and give thanks to God for these sacred shoots that are arising around us. And, and that we will find that as God promises them to us. The will that refuses to stay stuck in the chaos of the world sees those springs, anticipates again, hopes again, and figures out another way of being who God means us to be. When we let God in and we begin again to be practicers of thriving, God's power overcomes the brokenness of our fallen world and offers us a new way forward. The world will be made new because God is with us. In Romans 15, Paul gives us a glimpse of how we are to be, how the marks that we are to have to characterize our fellowship as followers of Christ as we await Emmanuel's second coming. First, Paul tells us that Christians should, come, <coughs> should have a consideration for one another, looking to do good for the other person, to build them up in their faith and surround them with an atmosphere of love rather than attacking others with criticism. Our Christian fellowship should be about studying the scriptures and from that study drawing on those scriptures for encouragement that can be found in God's word. For us as Christians, it's always better to be right with God and to suffer than it is to be right with man and just so we can avoid trouble. God's way is not the easy way, but it's the only way to eternity. God's word gives us the great and precious promises of God uh, because God never breaks those promises. And he gives us comfort from our sorrow and our, encourages us in our struggles. Christian fellowship should also be marked with fortitude. Fortitude is an attitude of the heart. It's more than just patience. It is a triumphant adequacy that can help us to cope with life. Uh, to, to not have despair, not to be in despair, but to believe in God and in the hope that is in God. It's not about hope in our own human spirit, but about hope in, in God's power, in the power that God has in our world. Christian fellowship should also be marked with harmony. That is not to say that there are not going to be differences in points of view between people in the church. But that's not to say that we're not going to have arguments or debates. But what it does mean is that we in the Christian fellowship have solved the problem of living together. That, that, we, that we are quite sure that the Christ that we worship, who unites us together, is greater by far than any differences that we have between us. Christ's fellowship should also be marked by our praise of Christ. In the main portion of our, is the main portion of our speaking, is it grumbling about the things of this world? Or is it a cheerful thanksgiving to God and praise of Him for all the things that He is and will do and is doing in our lives. Christ should enjoy, a uh, Christian should enjoy life because we enjoy God, because we carry the secret with us, knowing for sure that God is working the things together for the good of this world. And the essence of the matter is that Christian fellowship takes its example, its inspiration, its dynamics from Jesus Christ himself, who did not please himself. You see, Paul speaks of bearing the weaknesses of others and uses the same words that are used when they talk about Christ bearing the cross for us. When Jesus chose to serve others, instead of pleasing himself, what he did was he set a pattern for each one of us that as we seek to know Christ, we are to be following him and to accept the same burdens that, we, that he accepted, to do for others and to be a servant of our fellow Christians. Paul sounds the notes of the Christian faith, reminding us that our fellowship shouldn't be one of hope. 
It's easy in this life for us to fall into despair, but with God, there are no hopeless situations. There are only those who have grown hopeless in the times of chaos. Now, there is something about Christian hope, and that, and that something is that conviction that God is alive and God walks with us. When we truly believe that God is among us and that God works with us, then we know that no situation is hopeless. None of us are hopeless so long as we have the grace of Jesus Christ, and no situation is hopeless as long as we know the power of our God. Yet only when we live in the knowledge of Christ's power, which fills our every weakness, can we master life as we ought. Paul reminds us all who Christ is here to save. The root of Jesse shall come, and the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him Gentiles shall hope. We are those Gentiles. And in God, we have hope. It is not just the Jews, but all of humanity, that the God of hope has come down and into human form to live among us. Using Paul's imagery, it's God, that root of hope, who supplies life to a dead, cut-down, lifeless stump that has no future, has no purpose, and definitely does not have any signs of life. And yet with God... All things are possible, and through God comes the nutrition of grace and the everlasting water that renews life and makes all things new. A shoot, just a Jesus, on whom the Lord's Spirit rests, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, gives us a second chance at life. We are his branches, and there we bear the fruits of the Spirit through our supplier of life, God, who is hope. Real Christian community depends upon each of us working to make sure that the needs of others are met. It is then and only then that we as Christian communities can become outposts of the peaceable kingdom in the foothills of God's holy mountain. By ourselves, we can do nothing, but with God, all things are possible. When we love, when we welcome, when we share Emmanuel, God with us in our world today, then we stand as those signals to the nation that there is God among us, and there is a way to know peace, and there is hope in the midst of whatever despair surrounds us. There is joy even in the brokenness. We are called to stand as those signals. Advent is a reminder of that call, and a reviver of our hope. Amen. All right. Your questions. Where are the places that the wolf and the lamb lie down together in the Where do we see peace in our relationships, in our family, our circle of friends, in the neighborhood, in the city, the nation, the world? And even within yourself, where has peace been forged between previously warring factions within you?